Hi, my name is Manish Gupta, and in this video, I'm going to talk about PINA, which is a method for leveraging side information in extreme classification, uh, you know, uh, and specifically its full form is predicted instance neighborhood aggregation. OK, so let's let's get started and let's understand what this is. OK, so uh, so first let's basically try to establish a relationship between extreme multi-level classification and neighborhood aggregation. So, you know, what how are these two things making sense together? OK, so uh, if you think about extreme multi-level classification problems, these are problems where you have data points and you want to sort of uh, classify them in a multi-level manner uh, such that uh, the number of labels are in millions. Okay? So typically uh, people have uh, uh, in the past experimented a lot with label IDs rather than label text. So this paper sort of advocates usage of side information of two kinds. One is label text itself, which is label metadata, and also for borrowing information from neighbors. So, uh, you know, specifically they call it as instance correlation signals. Uh, so essentially, uh, for example, you know, uh, for a particular uh, um, for a particular product on Amazon, you may have co-purchase data, so they are like neighboring products. Similarly, you may have data about frequently bought together products. So that's basically instance correlation signals in the sense other products which are similar to this product, so that you can actually use that kind of extra information so as to find so as to recommend uh, other related products given a product title. Okay. So if your original XC problem was that, hey, I have a Amazon product and I basically want other recommendations, uh, you know, uh, from a from a label set of, uh, let's say, um, 10 raised to 6, a million uh, different products. So you could use the label metadata for each of those products, or you could basically also use this instance correlation signal that, hey, if I basically consider this particular label or this particular product, which are those which are co-purchased with it uh, or frequently bought together. Okay. So here is an example. So if you look at an e-commerce customer, well, the e-commerce customer uh, searches or buys things and also searches for stuff and frequently buys together stuff, right? Now, uh, and in this particular example, the XC problem is to product uh, to to uh, to basically you know uh, recommend uh, product keywords. Okay. So let's say if my input is this Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, and uh, what I want my XC model to do is to basically say that given uh, you know several labels like uh, Dan Brown, JK Rowling, reference books, Harry Potter, are those labels really relevant uh, or not? Okay. So so here notice that uh, you know the recommendation problem is not to find other relevant products, but the recommendation problem or the XE problem is to find good product keywords. So here is a product and I want to find good keywords. Now, good keywords. Uh, so, so the label set is pretty large because the number of keywords could be very many, yeah, too many, right? So, so, but I could leverage the semantics of these keywords um, as as extra information to do good XC, and I could also leverage, uh, you know, other uh, products that are bought, co-bought, or co-searched together as extra information uh, to be able to do uh, good extreme classification. Now, uh, to be able to make use of this graph kind of information, uh, you know, it is important to notice that uh, the XC problem uh, or the XC label matrix is equivalent to an adjacency matrix on the instance label bipartite graph. Now, what does that mean? That basically means that when you are given training data in uh, XC uh, training data, you are essentially have information about several samples X1 to Xn, and of course, there's a test sample also. Okay. And uh, then for each of those n samples, you actually have uh, uh, you know linkage information to one of the L outputs. So this is the matrix that we are talking about. This XMC label matrix. This is the XMC label matrix. Of course, right? it has zeros or ones, which basically tells that uh, you know for a particular data instance X1, you know which are the labels that are applicable. Yeah. Now this matrix is actually very similar to a bipartite graph matrix where in the bipartite graph on one side you have these data points on the other side you have L different level labels, right? So if you look at this bipartite matrix uh, uh, and bipartite uh, uh, graphs uh, adjacency matrix, this is basically equivalent to this XMC label matrix, okay? So therefore, what you could do is to really think of XMC task. So what is an XMC task? The task is that given X, given a new data instance XT, uh, test instance XT, what would be the uh, you know, label set Y, right? 
So this kind of task can be treated as a neighborhood prediction problem. So basically, let's say if XT came, or new, uh, came as a new node in this bipartite graph, who would be its neighbors in the on the label side? So it's basically the same as the neighborhood prediction problem. Okay. And uh, you know, keeping this in mind, uh, sort or, or rather, this kind of an equivalence motivates people, motivates these authors to think about uh, Pina, which is essentially predicted instance neighborhood aggregation. They basically say that if I have to basically decide the, uh, you know, uh, predict the neighborhood, then why shouldn't I make use of neighborhoods features while doing this prediction? Okay. So so far, uh, people have done. Uh, I mean, to, to come up with a good uh, representation, people have used PFA, which is predicted instance feature aggregation. So you know, if I want if I want a representation for a label, typically people do this PFA thing, which basically means that I look at all the data instances which are related to this label, and I actually just uh, add up, you know, take an average of their feature representations as the label representation. In this paper, they motivated uh, PINA, which is predicted instance neighborhood aggregation. So rather than looking at just the features of the instances, actually look at the neighborhood of these instances and do aggregation using the neighborhood. That supposedly gives you better results. Okay. So how is this PINA model trained? Okay. So the idea is that, uh, uh, you know, it can be, uh, so PINA is more like a, a Processing technique, which uh, or a pre-processing technique, which can be sort of uh, applied uh, for most of the extreme classification methods. Okay, so uh, typically, if you remember the XR transformers paper, well, uh, there people were using uh, uh, you know this PFA thing so as to essentially get a good representation for the label. So the way they would do that is to essentially uh, take the statistical TFIDF vector representations for all the data instances which are for which the label L is relevant, and then uh, sum up all of those TFIDF vectors and then normalize it um, so as to get a unit uh, norm vector, right? Unit norm vector. Now that was the PFA representation for any label L. Now uh, and and then they use that so as to essentially uh, in the XR transformers paper, you know, they use that so as to create a tree and uh, uh, you know uh, and uh, learn several XMC problems at each level. Um, uh, in the meanwhile, they were also learning an embedding representation, right? So, um, uh, so an an encoder in that sense is theta. So, which basically meant that. Uh, uh, after they were done with with the uh, with the first uh, uh, pass over the tree and learning that theta, they would then express uh, you know uh, these these label representations not just based on the text representations and uh, statistical text representation, but also based on the uh, phi DNN, which was uh, basically um, you know the neural learned representation. Okay. Now. In this particular case, Pina, they essentially go one step further. So they basically just don't depend on phi DNN. They basically want to care about coming up with something called as phi pre-trained. Okay, so how is this done? Okay. So uh, you see the uh, 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 so so how is this done is the question, and that is what motivates the Pina methodology. Okay, so let's basically talk about the Pina methodology as described on this slide now. Um, so as I mentioned, you could use neighborhood information so as to come up with better representations, right? So at train time, you essentially know the neighborhood of each of those X's, and then you can actually come up with a more uh, enriched representation for those X's. Okay, so that's great. However, at test time, you don't have that, right? So at test time, you basically uh, only know uh, that there is this data instance which has come in, but you don't know its neighbors. Okay. So therefore, uh, you know, uh, these folks basically motivate that if I have to make use of neighborhood, I have to make use of it at train time as well as test time. So therefore, let me actually learn a neighborhood predictor G. Okay. So let me actually use that so as to learn a neighborhood predictor, and uh, that should sort of uh, help me uh, uh, get, uh, uh, I mean, help me solve this problem of lack of neighborhood at test time. So the way they do that now, I mean, you know, uh, neighborhood predictor G. So, so the way they learn that neighborhood predictor is in the first stage called as pre-training stage, and then they make use of it at the stage two. Okay. So let's see how the pre-training happens. So in the pre-training stage, you construct this by matrix, by adjacency matrix uh, B pre. Okay. So, so notice, you know, in, at the train time, this is what is going on. You have the inputs one to n, and you have the outputs or labels one to l. You have the you know adjacency matrix B. However, that's not enough. So this by adjacency matrix B pre is more than just B. It also has B transpose. Okay. 
And then B pre is basically this. Uh, it's essentially uh, uh, N plus L cross N plus L matrix. You know, it's basically not N cross L matrix, but uh, it's a square matrix N plus L cross N plus L. Okay. So notice that there are also these identity matrices of size N cross N and L cross L, so as to make it really N plus L cross N plus L matrix. Okay. In some way, this matrix sort of says that every input and output, every data instance and label can actually be neighbors of each other, right? So that is what it does. So it basically brings the uh, data points and labels in the same um, sort of, uh, you know, uh, at, at the same level in some ways. Okay. And uh, um, now you're going to basically, uh, in the pre trained time, you're basically going to solve the XE problem of uh, uh, being able to link. Uh, uh, or predict, you know, um, uh, any of those n plus l outputs from the n plus l inputs. So both instances as well as labels, both x's as well as these l's are inputs as well as label nodes. Okay, so you actually solve a xe problem uh, using xr transformer or some such xe method so as to train both these g. So what is g? G is actually nothing but the xe problem itself, right? Essentially, it's the neighborhood predictor, and neighborhood predictor really here just means a label predictor. Okay. Uh, or a n plus l label predictor. Okay, so basically you learn that xc uh, thing while also learning your phi pre. Uh, phi is basically an M encoding method. So, so you know if you just use typical X, uh, you know xr transformer, your phi dnn that you will learn, the phi dnn that you learn is going to be basically your phi pre. Okay, so uh, and then you make use of both uh, label text as well as uh, the document text so as to be able to learn this phi pre nicely. Okay. Of course, you, uh, you know, as part of all this, using this XC formulation, you also learn G, which is basically your neighborhood predictor. Now, what happens in stage two? In stage two, essentially, uh, you uh, uh, freeze your G, and actually, you make use of that to extract top K nodes. So, essentially, uh, in stage two, what happens is that you have uh, your uh, uh, data instances, uh, both for the training as well as for testing. You're essentially going to use your neighborhood predictor. So as to get top K nodes, this is like negative mining, and, you know, or or you know, you could basically call it as relevant node mining in that sense. Okay. Once you have those top K nodes, you basically use phi pre to obtain numeric features for both instance and labels. And, you know, phi pre, that's the phi pre, but you also basically obtain, uh, you know, you also sum up over all of those uh, top K uh, neighbor nodes, right? So you, you sum up over top K nodes and you essentially also use the uh, phi pre presentation so as to sum up these things. So the first step, of course, you know, when you get a data instance, uh, you essentially, you know, get its neighbors using uh, a G, right? And then you essentially sum up their phi pre representations. So now you get like PNA representations rather than PFA representations. You no longer really get PFA because you're not summing up over statistical representations of XI, but you're actually summing up over, you know, these uh, uh, neighborhood based representations of XI. OK, um, and and sorry, the 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 uh, the, uh, the pre trained representations over XI, right? And uh, that basically gives you pretty reasonable representations, which you can then combine with your overall XI so as to uh, then, uh, you know, again, uh, do the downs downstream extreme classification task so that the true extreme classification task. Okay, so in short, in stage one, you're trying, you're solving a pre-training XMC problem, and again, you can solve it using XR transformers itself. Uh, that gives you an extreme classifier, which you can call as G. You know, actually, rather than calling an extreme classifier to avoid confusion, they call it the neighborhood predictor. Okay, and then the actual extreme classification problem is solved as uh, you know in in the downstream stage after you have figured out a good representation for each of those data points using the using the PINA methodology. OK, so how does PINA perform? Now they sort of uh, uh, compare PINA with several other methods, DCAF, Attention XML, Siamis XML, and XR Transformer itself. And what you observe is that XR Transformer compared with XR Transformer plus PINA, you know, you observe that across different data sets, across different data sets, and across different uh, matrix like precision, uh, at one, three, and five, you observe that uh, addition of PINA gives you a boost on top of the XR transformer itself. Okay. So another thing to observe is that uh, PINA does not just perform well on these short text data sets, but it does well on this Amazon Title 1.3 million, which is a long for long text data set as well. Right. So even there, you basically observe that addition of PINA gives you better results compared to just using the traditional XR transformer. 
OK, so in summary, in this uh, um, in this video, I talked about Pina predicted instance neighborhood aggregation rather than predicted instance feature aggregation. It is a, in some ways a data enhancement framework. Uh, it basically involves neighborhood aggregation. Uh, you know, and this neighborhood aggregation is reminiscent of uh, various other methods uh, like message passing and graph convolutions that people have proposed in the other settings. Yeah. So it allows the extreme classification models to leverage side information such as labeled metadata and instance correlation signals uh, for doing XC better. Okay. That's it for this video. Hope you like the video. Thank you for watching. Connect with me on my LinkedIn or look at my search on my homepage. Thank you.